Hey guys, I'm Jenna and I'm here at BookCon 2017 in New York City and I'm here with the amazing Cassandra Clare. Yay. And I am just so blessed by this opportunity. I'm such a huge fan of you. You're so Thank cool. You. So today I want to talk a lot about writing specifically because right, awesome. writing is really cool. So what is your favorite part about writing Shadowhunter books? I think that at this point, what I love about it actually is that I've been working on them for so long. Mm -hmm. It has such an intricate mythology yeah. that deepening the mythology is always incredibly fun. Like mm -hmm. when I'm thinking like, okay, how will, you know, how will I get these characters from point A to point B? I kind of go back through the mythology of the world that's already created mm -hmm. and like I can pull from so much stuff that's already happened and play off of that. Yeah. And, and it's, very, I, I was very conscious when I started writing Magisterium with Holly mm -hmm. of how much I didn't know about that world yeah. because I had been in this world I knew so well for so long. Yeah. So how did you kind of create that world at the beginning? Was it a lot of like dictionaries and like all these intense like encyclopedia stuff or is, was it just like scribbling notes everywhere? I mean both. It was like a ton of notes and also just like piles and piles of reference books, dictionaries, okay. symbols. I was lucky enough to be working as a journalist and we had mm -hmm. a ton of like free reference books. Yeah. I, had, like, I read like the dictionary of symbols, like diction you know, a ton of mythology, a ton of like other of, 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 of other urban fantasy to mm -hmm. kind of like get a sense of like what else was out there in the landscape. Yeah. History, stuff about New York, like just mm -hmm. a huge amount of historical stuff about New York was really helpful. Like the even to find the city of bones itself and like to invent that as a as a concept was yeah. a part of doing research into the history of New York and when they stopped um, putting cemeteries into oh, the yeah. city because they had run out of room. Mm -hmm. um, and the Marble Cemetery, which is the City of Bones, is one of the oldest still existing cemeteries in New York. I didn't know that. I'd lived in yeah, New York for forever, you? but like I had no <laughs> idea. So it became a location. So it was a mix of like sort of brainstorming and research. Yeah. Did you know you were going to have all these like series coming out later? You don't know because, you know, I saw the, the first trilogy over I felt like really lucky to do that. Yeah. And I had no idea if you were to like it. You know, if they didn't like it, if they didn't want to buy it, then you don't get to sell more books. So you're done. Did right? you have these ideas in your head while you were writing like City of Bones and stuff that I you were like, that. I know the history, but I can't share it yet? Yeah. There was a lot of stuff where, because I always feel to, like when you're talking about research and fantasy literature specifically I always think of it as the iceberg theory mm -hmm. like we always say okay the iceberg you can see 10% of it and 90% is below the surface yes you're doing 100% of the research and the world building you're going to see 10% of it in the book yeah but you are conscious of the other 90% right. and so that other 90% comes with you and you start and you use it as you go yeah you know so I was conscious of the story of like the infernal devices mm -hmm. as I was writing City of Ashes and City of Glass and I didn't get to use it yeah, until after until later. So what is your writing process like? Are you a pantser or are you a plotter? Like how, oh, how deep do you go? I'm a plotter. I am okay. a like dedicated plotter. I know pantsers and I don't know how they do it. Like yeah. I'm just like I would just crash into a wall. Mm -hmm. Like I wouldn't know what was gonna happen. So yeah. I am a I do a thing I call a macro plot and a micro plot. Okay. So I'll do a macro plot, which is I sit down and I basically write out, this is what happens in this book. Like if I yeah. was telling you, like, hey, I'm going to bore you for like half an hour and tell you what happens in this <laughs> yeah. book. That's my micro plot. My ma macro plot. Then when I'm actually working, every chapter, I will micro plot out the chapter. This is what happens in this chapter, this scene, this scene, this scene, this scene, this scene, this scene and then start writing. Cool. So I need to know all that stuff. Yeah. But just the way my brain works. Your books, I feel like, are really well known for being super diverse, especially with this new series that's coming out. I feel like you're branching out into more like diverse characters and stuff. Was that something you were like super conscious of while you were writing, or you just it happened that way? I was conscious of when I started, um, but not. But I'm more conscious of it now. Mm -hmm. Just you know, in terms of having hopefully, you know, evolved as a person. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I was really conscious of, honestly, when I started was that there that one of my good friends growing up um was gay and that we loved books it was one of the things that brought us together and he would talk about how really there was no one for him to relate to with the kind of books that he mm -hmm. liked to read and um he died actually mm -hmm. killed himself um and that often. was something that obviously like changed, you know changed my whole life it yeah me a lot and when i created alec i thought this is my way of giving this person the character they wanted and the happy ending they didn't get. Yeah. And then as I heard from more people about Alec and Magnus and what Alec and Magnus meant to them, I thought, I need to be 
better, be more diverse, yeah. like mm -hmm. be better, be kind of represent more neurodiversity, represent mm -hmm. more people who are of different skin color, different, you know, religion, mm -hmm. different, um, well, you know, gender identity. Yeah. And so, you know, I've definitely tried to bring that into this world. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, like I think, especially with the new series, but just, you know, as I get you know, more confident as yeah. a writer, I become hopefully mm -hmm. better, or at least more, you know, able to tackle people who are, you know, a lot like me. For me, Raphael is really important because I identify as asexual, and I've heard he identifies as asexual as well. He does. Um, so how do you go about writing somebody like that, that you're like, I don't know this experience? Do you do a lot of research on that? Do you talk to people? I've, actually, with something like um, asexuality, uh, what I'll do is read a ton of books yeah. and watch a ton of YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. um, I have people talking about their sexuality, how they experience it, how mm -hmm. they like to express it, how they like to see it expressed. It was something I knew about Raphael yeah. for a long time, and it's expressed on the page in Eldest Curses when mm -hmm. we see Raphael, he says I'm asexual. Yeah. Um, but I realized, you know, I, I had talked about it um, off the page, but I realized how important it is to have it on the page when I yeah. was talking to the TV people because they were talking mm -hmm. about Raphael and, and like having, having a romance, and I was like, Raphael is asexual. Yeah. And they were like, oh, like, and if I hadn't been there to tell them that, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have known. Yeah. So I was like, okay, this is why it's important to get this stuff down yeah, on the page. Yeah, definitely. But I am glad to have written him the way that I did with that intention. And mm -hmm to get it down on the page soon and, and also to have been able to be in a place to say that and also to have them listen because that meant that he says it on the TV show. Yeah. Like that's significant Definitely. for asexual visibility. Mm -hmm. For sure. So you obviously have had a lot of experience with adaptations. You had a film and a TV show. And um, maybe a musical. And maybe a musical. <laughs> um, how has that affected your writing? I mean, I think that... I have been, in a way, lucky to have had adaptations done of work that has been done for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think that it's probably good for me not to be too affected. Yeah. Because I kind of want to stick to my vision and what I'm doing. It is a difficult question. I think that the way that it's affected me is that it is a constant reminder of where these characters came from. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I was writing City of Heavenly Fire when the movie was being filmed. Right. And it was a consistent reminder watching it of where these characters were like in City of Bones. Yeah. And where they came from. And I think that was actually really good. And mm -hmm. in the same way, Shadowhunters is, is the early part of TMI. Yeah. And I'm constantly reminded, okay, this is this is where we started. Now this is where we are now. And yeah. It's very different. Yeah. You know? Awesome. So the last question I have, I ask all the authors that I interview, and it's really simple. What is the best writing advice you've ever received? I want to say some guy who said to me, deadlines are just theoretical. <laughs> That's actually probably really terrible mm -hmm. advice. <laughs> Maybe. I remember that someone once told me that the most significant, always keep in mind the most significant stakes for yourself and for the reader are the personal stakes of the characters. That, you know, you that the exterior stakes are significant, mm -hmm. you know. Is the world going to be blown up? You know, is Valentine going to take over yeah. the world of the evil demons? Like, you need that stuff. It activates the characters and the plot. But what we care about when we read is, is this person going to get what they want? Is, mm -hmm. Are they going to be happy? Yeah. You know, are these people going to stay friends? Are these people going to get together in a romance? Is this, you know, complicated, you know father-son relationship going to be able to resolve itself. These mm -hmm. are the personal stakes that are significant yeah. to characters, and you have to remember I focus on those first and the larger, the, the sort of, you know, big world stakes are the thing that put the characters in the position of being able to shape and resolve those stakes. Yeah, so, definitely. Great advice. Complicated, but it was yeah. really amazing. And then the last thing that I want to do is, it's a really quick lightning round, just some quick questions, sure. super easy. What are you currently reading? currently reading a book by Meredith Russo called uh, If I Was Your Girl about a trans girl, which is so good. I just read that a couple weeks ago. It's my, so, so good. I love the evocation of the place. I know. Like, it's like you're there. It's so, so good. good. Um, what's your Hogwarts house? Oh, Slytherin. Totally Slytherin. <laughs> Do you listen to Hamilton? Yeah, all the time. What's oh my God. a Hamilton song that you love? I mean, everybody loves Wait For It, right? Right. So that's like Classic. boring. Um, 
Oh, I love burn. Burn. Love burn. Burn is a classic and I'd emotional. I like turn it on and I like sing really loudly and my husband comes in and he's like, what have I done to you? <laughs> What's a favorite book that you read last year in 2016? Ooh, um, I read it, a fantastic book by Sarah Farazan called Tell Me Again How a Crush Should Feel. That one was really good and she has another book and I can't remember the title. It's a book about being queer in um, modern day Iran and I was oh, born cool. in Iran so for me it was this really amazing like book to read yeah. in terms of just experiencing the lives of people very distant from me but also connected to sort of this place that I have a connection to. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, what's a fictional character that you relate to? Ooh, what fictional character do I relate to? Um, not one that I've written, right? Like, this is just right. like, general just in general. Uh, character. I want to be like Aragorn, but I'm probably more like Sam. Mm. Or, That's you know, still good. like, not the person who gets to carry the ring up the mountain, but the person yeah. who gets to hang out with the person mm-hmm. who carries the ring up the mountain and is like, you can, yeah. you can do it! You can do it! That's me too. What's a book that changed your life? Ooh, um... I already know I already made a Lord of the Rings reference, but the Lord of the Rings totally, That's changed. So good. totally is what made me love fantasy. Like before that, I wasn't a person who loved fantasy. When yeah. I was young, I've read a ton of like, I read the Brontes, I read Austin, mm-hmm. I read a ton of like, you know, cl- classic, you know, fiction. I really loved it, and like, but I didn't, I w- was not interested in fantasy. I thought it was like the sort of sword and sorcery stuff that could never possibly interest me, and was yeah. all about like large, muscly men. Mm-hmm. And then I read Lord of the Rings, and was like, oh my god. Beautiful. <laughs> What's the worst job you ever had? Oh my god, working in Subway. Do not eat the tuna sandwiches. Uh, um, what's <laughs> your favorite place Don't that you it. visited? Um, the most beautiful place I've probably ever been is at the Maldives, small oceans in the in small islands in the Indian Ocean. But my favorite place that I've ever visited was um, Cambodia. I had a really, I was actually there recently, and I had like just a sort of really, the people were incredibly friendly, everybody was super kind. There are these incredible, it's incredible like mirror culture, it's Mm -hmm. incredible, and the history is amazing, and I had a great time. What is three things that you cannot live without? Chocolate, books, my cat Reginald. That's like every and introvert's dream. And your husband. Also He's a close husband. fourth. Well, that is all that I have today. Thank you so much for talking it with me. It was so me. nice to meet you. So nice to meet you. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.